Hey everybody, I wanted to do a video to talk about the collected works of Hugh Nibley. This is a book set that I just recently finished reading, and it's an awesome set of books. Totally awesome set of books. There's 19 books in the, in the collected works, and they are spectacular. It took me about eight years to read through all of the collected works of Hugh Nibley, so it's a, it's a lot of reading. you got to be very consistent to make it through them, but profound. Like Most chapters were just mind-blowing chapters, so there's a lot of good stuff in there. So I wanted to talk about these to help make these collected works more accessible to you to understand. Uh, and so I want to talk about some ways of reading them, some, what are some of the things that go on in the books to help you look at which books do you want to start with and read as you go through. So we're going to talk about these a little bit, uh, which I'm going to put some the graphics up here to give you ideas of which books to read and what to do. So this is the collected works of Hugh Nibley. This is all the books here for you to look at. Uh, they come in a pretty uniform style, so they're pretty easy to identify. Most of them are pretty thick books, though. They're, most of them are an inch or greater, sometimes inch and a half, two inches. So they're pretty good, pretty thick books. They are written in a more collegiate level writing, so they're not like a typical novel, uh, which is usually around a sixth, seventh grade reading level that most things are written for, like newspapers and things. It's not written for that. It's more collegiate. So if you want to keep a dictionary handy sometimes to look up certain words that he uses, you might need to. Granted, it's not quite as bad as the first couple chapters of Jesus the Christ from James uh, Talmadge. But it's still, you got to think through this stuff. In fact, one of the things that I realized as I was reading through Hugh Nibley is, is look at Hugh Nibley as a starting point. If you just read Hugh Nibley to just read Hugh Nibley, that's fine. But if you really want to understand what he's talking about, use his books as a starting point to send you into an area where you can study more. So I've looked at his books as that idea of this is the starting point. This is going to introduce me to a whole bunch of new concepts and ideas to help me understand the gospel better. And so I'm going to use this as a, as a starting point for a whole bunch of rabbit holes, basically, to run down to understand and get deeper into these concepts and ideas. So what I what I did is as I would read them along, I would look at the references that he gave in the back of each chapter. And then I would actually go look up some of those books and study them. So I've got, I, I've probably downloaded a hundred and something odd books uh, off of the internet. Most of them, because they're more than 50 years old, are... Uh, free of the copyright laws, and so you can download free copies from Google, or there's research websites you can go to that uh, will help you get those. So if you look up the title of the book, the name of the author, and the word PDF, you can usually find a PDF copy of a lot of these books, because a lot were, again, were written in the 30s and 40s, uh, as well as their translations of ancient apocryphal writings and things. So use his writings as a starting point for a, whole, for a deeper investigation into, into these concepts and ideas. It's profound. I got some. I got a couple years of reading to do to get caught up with what I, what I caught from his books. So awesome stuff, though. Awesome stuff. So let's talk about a couple of ways to look at these books because it seems pretty daunting to realize that, you know, these are 19 books that are more an inch or more thick, and uh, they're pretty good, pretty substantial books. But let's talk about some different ways of looking at these books. Okay. So one way to look at these books is if you want to understand the Book of Mormon. So he has three books that have a lot of information that are specifically about the Book of Mormon that you can use. So one of them is a book called An Approach to the Book of Mormon. So it's just talking about the Book of Mormon, some of the history of the Book of Mormon, how it actually connects with Jewish history and Old Testament history, some of the things that show that what Joseph Smith put together in the Book of Mormon actually is 100% true. So a couple of examples of that is one at the beginning of the, of, uh, the Book of Mormon, 1 Nephi, we learn that Lehi was teaching his children Egyptian. Now, Laman and Lemuel's names are Arabic in origin. Nephi and Sam are Egyptian in origin. So you can see some transitions and things of, of how the trade routes went and who were the trading partners that Lehi was working with over time. The uh, interesting thing is... Uh, it's, this is something that is really, really important for us to look at because when the Book of Mormon was first written, it's amazing that uh, I mean, none of this kind of information was out there. A lot of scholars actually said that Joseph Smith 
lied. It, he just made all this stuff up because there was no evidence to show that Egypt had any ties, relationships with uh, Palestine and the the, uh, the nation of, of Israel at the time. Basically, sorry, lost my train of thought for a second there. The but what's fascinating is because of the research that we have since the Book of Mormon was translated, we have so much evidence now that proves the Book of Mormon is true. In fact, what's fascinating is if the Book of Mormon were written today, if Joseph Smith did that or somebody else did that in our day and age, in the 20th century, they would be seen as a fraud and a plagiarist, basically, because they would just say, oh, you just read all these ancient writings and then just made up your own narrative based on these ancient writings. The beauty is those ancient writings were not discovered till after the Book of Mormon had been translated. And they all prove that what, said, what, we, what we learned in the Book of Mormon has a lot of basis in ancient history. Like the story of Moroni and the, the um, uh, title of liberty. Sorry, I just about called it something else. There's a lot of ancient history through the Old Testament times that shows that the idea of using a flag to rally people together is not uncommon. It's a very common thing. In fact, if you look at any any show, any movie that talks about medieval fighting or or ancient historical battles or is based on those kinds of things, you'll always see flag bearers. And that's an important idea that happened from, from those ancient times. So Moroni, Captain Moroni, was just following those ancient traditions. We didn't know that much about some of those ancient traditions until after the Book of Mormon was translated, though. So it's really fascinating. So An Approach to the Book of Mormon is a really good book that gets into some of these ideas of how to really understand the Book of Mormon from historical values and realize that there's so much in there that is based on facts and things that we understand today. So it's really good. Another one is the Prophetic Book of Mormon. That is a really good one as well. If you want to understand what are the things the Book of Mormon talks about in regards to the future. It's not quite a Latter-day Prophecy type book, but it, it he talks about some of the things that it predicts and for our day and age that are that's in there. So some of the things we understand, it's come to pass, not a big deal, we, under, we get that, some haven't. So it's a really good thing to understand the prophecy in the Book of Mormon and what does it foretell and predict. Uh, it, it was really good, really good. Like I said, you read a chapter, your mind is just blown, and then you read the next chapter another week later, your mind's blown again. It's just awesome stuff. Uh, the other book on the Book of Mormon is Lehi in the Desert. Now, this is actually three smaller books put together. So, Lehi in the Desert, The World of the Jaredites, and There Were Jaredites. So, these are three smaller research things that he did. And he talks about, uh, in Lehi in the Desert section, he talks a lot about the ideas about Lehi, his life, how he was living his life, and this understanding that, that uh, having Jews flee Jerusalem to go out and hide in caves on the outskirts of Jerusalem until conditions were safe, then even use going off into the desert to live is 100% plausible. It's a very plausible idea. In fact, there's a story from ancient uh, the ancient world of a gentleman named, I believe it was Jonadab Rechab, and uh, he lived in Jerusalem about the time of Lehi, in fact. No, actually, he lived before a little bit before Lehi. This is about 700-ish B.C. time frame, so a little bit before Lehi he decided that the Jews at the time were not living the true gospel. They weren't living the law of Moses the right way. They had a more just a, a secular way of living. They kind of t took God out of it and made it a bunch of rules, basically. And so he decided that he was going to take his family, sell all of his stuff that he had, and move into the desert with his family and any friends and people that would follow him to become nomads, to live off the land, to wander around and to worship God in the true way that they should be doing instead of what the Jews were doing at Jerusalem. So he leaves and goes into the wilderness to do this. And so there's actually a historical basis of people doing this for the same idea that uh, as Lehi going into the desert as well. And it talks about some of the things about Lehi and, you know, his travels and, and what are the plausible routes he took and how things worked out. It's really good. Really good stuff. A lot of good information there. The other two sections are about Jaredites. So this is about the book of Ether. And I was really surprised at what I learned in those two sections because I think a lot of people look at the Jaredites as, because they come from the Tower of Babel, we're talking, you know, 2500 to 3500 BC time frames. So this is book of Genesis is where the Jaredites come from. 
So if we if we compare where the Book of Ether starts with the Jaredites and the Tower of Babel, this story is in the Book of Genesis. So this is not the end of Genesis either. This is early in Genesis. So this is a pretty. They come from a very early stage. In fact, it's interesting to think about that the the Jaredites basically come from a time before Abraham. They lived before Abraham did. So there, it's really interesting to really wrap your brain around thinking how ancient the Jaredites really are and how long they lived for thousands of years, basically, because they lived all the way up to the time of being found uh, by the Mulekites who came from Jerusalem um, at the at around 6, 587, 585 AD, around the time of the destruction of Jerusalem, when they fled, uh, which was about 10 years after Lehi had already left. So that's, you, you know, you can kind of see where that all ties in. So it's their really ancient culture. These Jaredite, these stories of the Jaredites are interesting because I think a lot of people think, oh, they left Jerusalem, you know, they left the Tower of Babel, which was ancient Mesopotamia, and then they sailed to America. And I think a lot of people just assume a Atlantic uh, crossing for them. But what Hugh Nibley points out here is that a lot of the traditions, a lot of the ideas that happen inside the Book of Ether actually match up with ancient traditions of Asian cultures. So he believes that there's a good chance that they went from ancient Mesopotamia, so around Iraq, Iran area, they went north up to the Asian steppes, across the Asian steppes to China, and then sailed on a Pacific Ocean to America. Possibly settled, hit somewhere, you know, followed out there through the, uh, the ocean up there, and then went over to like Canada maybe, and then settled in Canada, and then started migrating south from there. We don't know 100%, but that's a very plausible scenario. Uh, there are stories, yes, uh, from the uh, Algonquin Indians of turtle boats that came up through the uh, Great Lakes area. Um, but if you really look at those traditions, they don't necessarily date as far back as the Jaredites do. And they show that they were a group of people who already lived in northern Canada that migrated down and then took those boats inland, basically. So not necessarily the ideal situation for the Jaredites, so, but a lot of people try to claim that they are part of the Jaredites. And I, the dates and the times and the ages and stuff don't necessarily match up all the way, so I wouldn't say that that's a that it's plausible there's some similarities and ideas in there but it's not necessarily enough information to prove that that's exactly the Jaredites settled uh in the great lakes areas first they you know they settled around and did that so just because they used a, a turtle boat type idea doesn't necessarily mean that that's what that was the Jaredites okay now this is a this important thing to understand the boats because the boats that the Jaredites used Okay, are also in a way called the Magur boats, M-A-G-U-R, I think is what they're called, the Magur boats. Now, these actually come from the traditions of how the Ark was built. So they built boats based upon what they knew from the Ark, which was the largest boat ever built at the time, basically. If you think of this, these, you know, the Jaredites are coming from the Tower of Babel, which was just a couple of hundred years after the flood happened. They were still worried about the flood, which is why the Tower of Babel was built to get up and to be up high enough that you could get over, you could basically run up this mountain and you would be above the flood. So there was a lot of traditions and ideas built around that. So they were still understanding the stories. They weren't many generations removed from the children of Noah that made, that were there and lived through the flood in the ark. So there's a lot of traditions there. In fact, there's a, a lot of interesting traditions around the idea of the, uh, stones, the white stones that the brother of Jared had this, the Lord touch to do things. There's actually a tradition that goes back to Noah having glow-in-the-dark crystals that he could see in the ark. So fascinating stuff. I, I'm sorry, I'm telling too many cool stories. There's just so much fun stuff to learn. A great book, great book, really fas fascinating stuff. But it, it makes more sense that they actually had more of a, of a went across Asia and then settled, came across the Pacific Ocean. So some interesting stuff in there, really well worth learning, especially when you get into the Book of Ether and understand stuff there. A lot of good stuff. All right, so let's move on. 
Uh, Old Testament. Now, if you want to understand more about the Old Testament by using the works of, of uh, Hugh Nibley, these are the books you want to read. So there's a lot of good stuff in each of these books. Now, uh, One Eternal Round is a really interesting book that talks about how there's patterns in the ancient world of how things work. And uh, with temple ceremonies, with religion, and uh, you know things like that. So really good book. To, to get into some of the ancient traditions that we would look at today and go, oh, yeah, we kind of understand these ideas, you know, and so they're really fun. So that was a really good book to read. Uh, the Ancient State is another one, and this one is a, a little prehistory for the Old Testament uh, in that it really goes back to understanding some of the, the very ancient ideas of establishing kingdoms and religions and the year rites and things like that and how that has translated into more recent concepts of how we do things these days, uh, like the idea of the arrows and the sticks. Uh, he goes into a lot about the whole sticks that Ezekiel talks about, the two sticks that come together, you know, tally sticks and arrows and things, and how they used to prove kingship and, and rights and, and things like that. So really good book to get into some of those ancient cultures. Uh, really fascinating ideas there. Uh, Since Camorra is a really fascinating book. So uh, when I looked at this book, I wasn't quite sure what it was at first, but what it means, the whole the whole title tells you what it means. Since Camorra. Now, Camorra is the hill where the uh, gold plates were deposited that Joseph Smith went and got out. So Since Camorra is talking about all of the ancient records that we have discovered since the time of Joseph Smith translating the plates. So if you remember, we talked about in an approach to the Book of Mormon, how all this stuff happened, how basically Joseph, if he did it today in the 20th or 21st century, if he translated the Book of Mormon today, he'd be seen as a complete plagiarist. So it's fascinating how much has come out since the time of the Book of Mormon coming forth. So it's almost as if the Book of Mormon came forth first, it had to come forth, then there was an explosion of information. It's just all kinds of stuff has come forward with the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Nag Hammadi texts, Shabako stones, uh, you know, even the Lakish, Ostrasa, there's all kinds of great stuff. So if you, want a, if you want a book that says, I, I want to understand the apocryphal writings and just kind of get into understanding those, and where should I, what are books I should read and what should I do to understand those, Since Kimura is just a whole bunch of rabbit holes, basically, that you can just start going down. Fascinating stuff. Fascinating, fascinating stuff. Really good book. Uh, then, of course, he has one Old Testament and uh, related studies. So these are going over some of the stories of the Old Testament and ancient cultures and traditions. Really fascinating book. So it's a good one to understand the Old Testament as well in more detail. A lot of good stuff in there. Uh, the other one is Enoch the prophet. And I put this one in here classified as understand the Old Testament because Enoch is a prophet from the Old Testament times. He is, I think he's the great grandfather, if I remember right, of Noah. But he's the originator of the flood prophecy. So a lot of fascinating stuff about Enoch the prophet that's in there. Highly recommend that book. That's one, that's, Enoch the prophet is probably one book that I absolutely recommend everybody read, especially if you want to understand uh, ain't Latter-day prophecy. There is never a book. I've read a lot of books on Latter-day prophecy from Dwayne Crowther and, you know, Doctrines of Salvation and all these other things that are out there, which are great books to read. I've watched all these videos on YouTube to, to understand what are people's opinions and ideas and what are they coming up with in their studies. Uh, but I'll tell you, I've never read a book that explains the latter days more than Enoch the prophet. He is the first missionary of the world. He was called to go preach repentance to the people after they had gone really, really wicked in the pre-flood days. And then he was warning them of if they don't repent, then there's going to be destruction coming on them. And so he's a great prophet, amazing stuff, amazing stuff in this book. So well worth reading. In fact, what I learned, one of the things I learned about this was the book of Enoch, okay, his writings were seen in the ancient world through the, the early Old Testament times. It was seen as one of the most religiously sacred books ever back then. It was replaced later by the books of Moses as sacred texts, but it was super, super important to the people back then. And then as people became less religious and more secular in their, in their religious teachings, uh, they 
got rid of the Book of Enoch because it didn't jive with what they said. The Book of Enoch is all about warnings of if you don't repent and change your ways, you are going to be destroyed, basically. So they didn't like it after a while, and so they kicked it out. And, of course, uh, it's, it's just it's fascinating. You need to understand the Book of Enoch. It's the beginning of the pattern of the pride cycle. It's the beginning pattern of all these things that happen that are culminating in the last days. So profound stuff, very profound stuff in that book. Highly recommend reading that one a couple of times, honestly. There's a lot there. All right, uh, let's jump to the New Testament now. So the New Testament, there's several books here. And if you notice, I put Since Camorra and Enoch the Prophet in here as well to understand New Testament. So I did that uh, for a couple reasons. One is I put Since Camorra up here to, to help you understand the New Testament because it gives more ideas of other teachings, other scriptures, other apocryphal writings that also existed and came out of the New Testament times. So one thing that's important to understand about the New Testament is the New Testament isn't a narrative story. Like the, the Book of Mormon is a, is a narrative. It's like a journal, and it's passed down, and there's, there's, you know, as the chapters progress, we're going, we're progressing through history. The New Testament isn't that. The New Testament is, you have the four Gospels that is the life of Jesus, basically, select parts of his life. It's not the full full thing there. Uh, but it, then the most of it is getting into letters written by apostles. Now, most of the New Testament, I have learned, actually it was written after 70 A.D. Now, that's an important thing to think about. The New Testament, most of those letters were written after 70 A.D. Okay, The Savior was born, they believe, around 3 B.C. He lived to somewhere in his early 30s, possibly somewhere around there, had three years of ministry, and then was crucified. So around 36, by, by 36 A.D., he was gone. Between 30 and 36 A.D., somewhere around there. I'm, I'm just throwing out some rough estimates. And then most of the, again, most of these letters and everything was written after 70 A.D. So it's significant because it is decades after the Savior's death, and 70 A.D. was the fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy of the abomination of desolations when Titus destroyed Jerusalem. If you want a really good book on that, S.G. Brandon's book, The Fall of Jerusalem and Christianity, is a really good book. Uh, not, not that it, It's a little bit of a dry book. I mean, it's a collegiate-type book. Really good book. You can find it online because it was written in the 30s, I think, 30s. 36 or something like that, 1936. Great book. Really great book to understand the fall of Jerusalem and what happened back then. So, uh, really good book. But anyways, there's a lot of other writings that were around at the time, and so since Camorra talks about some of those writings. So they still help in understanding some of the New Testament ideas. I put Enoch, the prophet, on here as well because the book of Enoch actually influenced a lot of the New Testament writings, the authors. Those letters that they were written by the apostles, there are over, I believe it said, 172 verses in the New Testament that read verbatim from the book of Enoch. So they know, scholars know, that the early apostles were very familiar with the book of Enoch. And they use some of the teachings out of the book of Enoch to illustrate their own ideas in some of these letters to convey those same types of messages and themes to the people in their day. So, in fact, that from what I understand, the Jews really hated the book, book of Enoch even more after the Christians adopted it and started to, started to accept that book more. So, it's fascinating that it's there. In fact, in the book of Jude, the book of Enoch, Enoch himself is actually mentioned in the book of Jude. So, and then there's, a, there's one more reference, I believe, in the New Testament. There's two references, I think, in the New Testament to Enoch. And I can't remember what the other one was. But Jude explicitly says Enoch. Most of the rest of them are just more of, they're alluding to the same concepts of what Enoch has in his book, or they actually quote Enoch without giving the reference. They quote him practically verbatim. So Enoch, the prophet, that writing has a strong influence in New Testament writings. So it's a really good book to read to give some historis, historical ideas and value to the New Testament, which is good too. And it's just a powerful book to read. In fact, it's mentioned in, I think, section 93 of the Doctrine and Covenants, specifically when the, when the Savior is talking to Joseph Smith about other writings that will come forward, he specifically mentions Enoch's writings. 
And it's fascinating the history of how we got the Book of Enoch in an English translation to use. That's a cool story that, that's in this book from Hugh Nimby. All right, let's jump forward. Sorry, there's so much in these guys. I'm just, these are fun books to read. If you can tell, I really enjoyed them. And it just, again, it's mind-blowing what's in these books. So sorry, this is a bit of a long video. All right, so let's see, The World and the Prophets. This was a good book. I read this one early on. Uh, so I'm going to go back and reread this one again. This is a good book that talks about the ideas, the concepts and ideas of how prophets teach things that are different and in somewhat opposition to the rest of the world. So he kind of talks about how the world goes this way and how prophets want us to go this way over here. So a really good book to contrast worldly teachings with prophetic teachings of the prophets and things. Pretty good stuff. Really good things in there, New Testament things. Now, the other one is Apostles and Early and Bishops in Early Christianity. So this one is more of a post-New Testament writing, talking about how that transition happened from as, as this after the Savior died and and the original apostles were persecuted and eventually killed off, how the church went through the apostasy, and and how the Catholic Church basically emerged, this, this Christian church emerged that later turned into the Catholic Church, uh, you know, and up through the fourth century with Constantine and those kinds of things, and how the, the scriptures formed a little bit in there as well. So it's just fascinating how they tried to come together and understand how do we make sense of these teachings and continue this church forward after the death of the apostles. So a really good book, really, really good book to understand some of those things as well. So it, really good. So if you want to do New Testament, these are the four books out of his series that would be good for you to look at. All right, so of course, Pearl of Great Price. We want to do a lot in here. And he has a ton. If you can, you can tell, there's a lot of books about the Pearl of Great Price. Now, some of these, the Pearl of Great Price actually comes from Old Testament times. So you could really read these books from Old Testament as well. So they, they, they come together, basically. So you could really just read all these, and it does Old Testament and Pearl of Great Price at the same time. So the thing that's interesting about these is how powerful the Pearl of Great Price is. I love the Pearl of Great Price, and... It's just, it's, it's amazing. I've learned, I've realized that the Pearl of Great Price is a key. It unlocks and opens the ability to understand ancient records and scriptures from all over the place. It really does. It's so cool. So, so cool. There's so much there. Uh, in fact, Hugh Nibley has an interesting experience in, in teaching about the Pearl of Great Price. Um, and I can't remember which book it was that he mentions it in, that he talks about this. Uh, he says that he, he, you know, when he was teaching at BYU, there wasn't a Pearl of Great Price class necessarily. They taught, you know, Book of Mormon, Doctrine of Covenants, the Bible, stuff like that. But there really wasn't a class on the Pearl of Great Price. And so he went to the, the governing board and says, why don't we do a class on Pearl of Great Price? There's a lot of information here. And they said, well, we really don't think that there's enough to put a full quarter semester curriculum together. It's a good book, but we can't fill a whole class period, you know, the whole whole semester for it. And uh, so we, we don't think it's worth it. And he says, there's absolutely more information than one class period, honestly. There's so much in here, it's amazing. So they said, fine, you go build the course and you bring it to us and we'll see what we, what we think about it. So he did. He went and developed the whole course and they were shocked at actually how much information he put together in there. Uh, if you want to watch, in fact, his Pearl of Great Price class, it was recorded when he taught at BYU, they recorded it, and it's on YouTube. You can go look it up. Hugh Nibley, Pearl of Great Price class. You can watch it. It's fascinating. I think I've watched it three times already. Uh, his Book of Mormon class is up there as well. But these are the books for the Pearl of Great Price. Now, we've talked about Enoch because there's two chapters in the Book of Moses in the Pearl of Great Price about Enoch. Fascinating story about these. Those two chapters is the most information we have had on the Book of Enoch basically, okay? And it's profound, very profound that those two chapters are there. Now, the, the Book of Enoch was originally translated in the early 1800s into English from an Ethiopic translation that was discovered, I think, in the 1600s is when they found it. And then it's just basically sat in the basement of a museum because they didn't, we already had, you know, the story of Noah and the flood and the, the Epic of Gilgamesh and all those. So they just saw this as a, the Book of Enoch as just a rehash of those same stories, not realizing that it's more of the original and Gilgamesh is more of the copy. 
but that's just the way people thought back then. So it got eventually translated in the early 1800s to English from this Ethiopic translation. The two chapters we have in Moses were not found in the Ethiopic translation. But in 1870, they discovered a Greek translation of the book of Enoch. The two chapters we have in the book of Moses were in the Greek translation in 1870. So it's fascinating, absolutely fascinating. Long, before, long after Joseph Smith passed away and gave us the Pearl of Great Price, we actually found those two chapters in an ancient writing book. So cool. So Enoch plays a big role in the Old Testament, So and he's a big part of the Pearl of Great Price because of that. And so that's why I put him here. Of course, Old Testament-related studies goes into similar ideas because the Pearl of Great Price talks about Abraham and Moses, two key prophets from Old Testament times. So, of course, since Camorra talks about that, the Apocryphon of Abraham, Apocryphon of Moses, those are ancient writings. The ancient state talks about some of those ancient rituals. Uh, One Eternal Round is in there as well, World and the Prophets, to get more ideas about how prophets are seen throughout time. And then we add the three books of Abraham. Now, Hugh Nibley wrote three whole books on Abraham. And, in fact, that's the next thing I want to talk about is just studying Abraham. If you want to understand the book of Abraham and the, the, the facsimiles that are in Abraham and all those things, these are the three books you're absolutely going to want to read. Profound, absolutely profound. Everybody who really wants to understand the gospel better should read these three books. Absolutely profound. So let me talk about these real quick. An approach to the book of Abraham. This book here is not so much about Abraham's life. That's actually the other one, Abraham in Egypt. It is more about Abraham's life and the stories of his childhood and, and growing up, and, and he practically got sacrificed to the gods twice in his life. Uh, so it's interesting that he ended up having to be asked by God to sacrifice his only son to him, basically. It's really interesting ideas. But this book, An Approach to the Book of Abraham, really talks more about how did we get the Book of Abraham, and what are the complaints that the anti-Mormon groups talk about with this book, and the, the Egyptologists in the Back then in the early 1900s, uh, late 1800s, that tried to discredit Joseph Smith with his translation of the Book of Abraham and everything else. So if you want to really understand all the stuff around the Book of Abraham, that's a good one to read. Fascinating stuff. He just obliterates any arguments against the Book of Abraham as being original and gets into it. There is some more updated information that they have. They have the church, I think, has a couple of their gospel essays that talk about where the Book of Abraham came from, which is good. And there's another LDS scholar, oh, rats, I just forgot his first name. I think his last name is Guy or something like that. It's, it's like right there. But he is, he is an Egyptologist, LDS Egyptologist, you know, ancient scholar. And he has some videos, actually. I think he did a, a talk at the at Fair Mormon several years ago and did a talk about uh, Abraham. A lot of good information there as far as where did it come from, what happened to the papyrus, those kinds of things. Uh, so the book Abraham in Egypt is about his life and going into Egypt and how that worked out and, and all those kinds of things. So if you want to get more about Abraham's life, that's a good book to read. The scriptures do tell us that we should do the works of Abraham. And that's the, the Savior mentions that. I think it's in the Doctrine and Covenants where he says we should be doing the works of Abraham. That's an important concept. So if you study this book, Abraham in Egypt, you understand what that means to do the works of Abraham. Profound, I have tried to adopt those ideas into my life more, and it's fascinating, fascinating stuff there. Now, the other one is the message of the Joseph Smith papyri. You can tell that this one's, the the covers look different, it's designed different as a book, um, because it was kind of after the collective works of Hugh Nibley were done, they added that book into it, basically. Now, this one is all about translating the papyrus that Joseph Smith had, basically, which is really fascinating because it's not so much about the Book of Abraham that we got. It's more about these papyrus, which was the Book of the Dead, the Book of Breathings type writings that were very common in ancient Egypt. So there's hundreds of versions and hundreds of copies of the Book of the Dead and the Book of Breathings that were buried you know, with tons of mummies for a long time in Egypt. So it's really fascinating. But those papyrus, while they're not necessarily the book of Abraham, we don't have a papyra that is the book of Abraham. And that's where you read the approach to the book of Abraham. talks more about that. These are the papyrus that they did have that are very Egyptian and very good. 
And it's fascinating when you read them and understand that the Egyptians understood a lot of true concepts. That's why it says here it's an Egyptian endowment. These, the Book of the Dead, the Book of Breathings, were books that were written in ancient Egypt. See, Egypt had a huge thing with resurrection. They believed that Egypt, the country of Egypt, their land was like the sacred land, like the center of the universe, center of the world kind of thing. It was the sacred land of God. And uh, so to you want to be resurrected. So the pharaohs would be resurrected and you'd want to be resurrected to live with the pharaohs and gods as well, which is why they didn't conquer. Egypt didn't necessarily go out and conquer and live, expand their empire out like Assyria and Babylon and Rome and the other ones did, because they believed if you died outside of Egypt and you were buried out there, you didn't get resurrected. You had to be buried in in Egypt. So they didn't expand. They stayed. They would go out and fight wars and take over places, but then they'd come back. So it's just interesting. And so they really believe this idea that in order to be resurrected, you had to know certain things. You had to understand code words. You had to know certain handshakes and certain signs and tokens that would allow you to pass by the angels who were standing at guard at the gates of heaven to allow you in. And so these Book of Breathings, while some of them were talking about the rituals of the, the burial ceremonies and the prayers given to the dead as you as you prepared the bodies uh, for burial, but it also talked about these secret things you needed to know, the secret knowledge you needed to get to heaven with. And so they buried the mummies with these books so that when the mummies came, when they were resurrected, came back, they had the book there. They could open it up, refresh their memory, go through them. Yes, that's right. And then use that to get into heaven. So they buried them with the cliff notes of how to get to heaven, basically. That's kind of what it is, and this was a very common tradition in ancient Egypt. So this is the translation of those Joseph Smith papyri, and it's fascinating stuff, really good stuff. Uh, I have definitely spent a whole lot more time studying Egypt than I ever have in my life because of reading these three books, gotten courses on it, read it. Egypt is fascinating and is very important for people to realize the value of ancient Egypt and their traditions and cultures and how they've influenced the world. It's fascinating. Egypt, we owe a lot to Egypt. There's a lot of good stuff there. So that's a good one. Now, the last one, of course, is understanding modern times. If you want to understand more, uh, use Hunibli's writings to understand the more modern teachings and modern times and, and how to do things these days, these are the books you want to read. Okay, and there's quite a bit of them on here. Uh, Enoch the Prophet is there, like we talked about. It's one of the best Latter-day Prophecy books I've ever written, ever read, not written, sorry, ever read. Uh, it was, it's, it's amazing. So profound. So I recommend that one. Uh, the World and the Prophets is in here as well. Apostles and Bishops and Early Christianity is in here as well. Those are three we've already talked about. The rest of these we haven't talked about. So Mormonism and Early Christianity. This is a good one that kind of picks up after Apostles and Bishops and Early Christianity. So it's more about understanding the comparing and contrasting Christianity with Mormonism basically, and a lot of good essays and writings on that. Really fascinating book on those kinds of things. Uh, Tinkling Symbols and Sounding Brass. This is one of the biggest books uh, in the Collected Works of Hunibly. It's a thick one. And uh, it is all about understanding and answering the questions of uh, the, the anti-Mormon groups propose, basically. It's, it's divided. It's actually, it's a whole book that's actually, the first half of it is all about the issues with Joseph Smith. The second half is issues with Brigham Young. And then each of those halves are actually broken into smaller parts. So it's like four small books combined into one large one. Uh, and it's fascinating. Fascinating stuff. One of the books in the Brigham Young part is a court case where, where Hugh Nibley presents his information in a narrative of a court. So there's Christians against the Mormons in a court case, and a Jew is the one that is the neutral observer debating what is true. You know, it's a really fascinating idea. So it, it's a really good way to present the information and debate topics and ideas and discussions and things. Uh, one of the sections is actually called How to Write an Anti-Mormon Book, and it's really good. It's a really good one. He talks about the different ideas and techniques that are used in writing an anti-Mormon book to make it sound credible. And it's, it, after reading it, you, you can pretty much look, see through anti-Mormon books. I read this one when I was on my mission in the South, and it helped me because anytime someone would say, here's an anti-Mormon book, you should read this about your religion, I'd say, great, let me take it and I'll read it. I would read it, and then it helped me to understand how to look through 
the assumptions and deceptions and things in there. And it's, it's even helped me to understand even some of the crazy stuff going on in the world today, how to, how to understand, how to look for truth and what's not true and see through assumptions and, and things that people do that are false. So really good book. It's a thick one. It's a big one, but a lot of good information. Um, temple and the Cosmos. If you want a book to help you understand the temple, this one is a really, really good one. It, it's all about the temple. It's all about the cosmos. It really gets a lot of ideas through history of how the temple and the temple ceremonies have been used since Adam and Eve's time. And they've been there. They've had endowments. They've had these things there. We just didn't realize it. And now that we can see these trends and patterns in the ancient writings, we can understand how the gospel has always been on the earth in some form uh, throughout all of history. So it's a really good book, really good, fun book to understand uh, the temple. Uh, the books, the, the ones on Abraham as well, give a lot more perspective too about the temple, which is really nice. But this one really dials it in well, specifically for the temple. Uh, Approaching Zion is one was one of my favorite books from Hugh Nimbley. This book is somewhat, I think, somewhat controversial uh, for some people because the whole point of this book is helping people understand what is Zion. What is a Zion community and society like? So that is the ideal situation that we should be working towards is becoming Zion. And when we become like Zion, then the real Zion, the city of Enoch, can come down and meet and, and everything else. So what does that mean? And so approaching Zion is about understanding how to get there. So if you want to read a book that is going to help you understand how to improve your life, how to live the gospel better so that you can be more Zionistic yourself, have more of that idea, ideal standards in your life to be prepared for Zion, then that's the book you want to read. I will tell you that you need to read it with an open mind and you need to be willing to make changes to your life. Otherwise, again, this is why it's a little controversial of a book. Because some people will read it and then decide they don't want to have to make those kinds of changes to their life and then get upset with it and then have to find a reason to justify not following what they just learned. So if you're not looking to make changes to your life, you think you're pretty, you know, you're the all is well in Zion idea, don't read that one. Don't read Approaching Zion because you'll learn that you got work to do. <laughs> you got work to do. If you want to have a bit of a humbling experience and you really want to see what else can I do, how can I take my understanding of the gospel, how can I really do more with it and follow Christ more than read Approaching Zion. You'll like it. It's a good book, really good book. A lot of good ideas and concepts. Uh, it is a little bit depressing sometimes to read it because then you look at the world and go, man, we are so messed up. We are so in trouble. It's just, the whole world's just messed up. Uh, because he, you know, you start to see that contrasting of here's what God wants, but here's where the world is. So it's a really good book. Uh, the other one that's on here uh, is Brother Brigham Challenges the Saints. Fascinating book. Absolutely fascinating book. This is my number one book that I think everyone should read from Hugh Nibley is this one. I, I believe that everybody, when they turn, you know, 18 years old or when they get off their mission, if they go on a mission, wait till after your mission to read this book. If you don't go on a mission, then when you're 18, you should read this book. Uh, and this will help you with the rest of your life. It just helps you to understand stuff. So this is a, it's a compilation of, of uh, things that Brigham Young taught the early saints, and as he helped them to settle in Salt Lake Valley and establish the church, establish the cities and, and the civilization here, he gave some challenges to the saints. He tested them on some things and had some concepts. And I can tell you it is amazing what Brigham Young taught that has so much application in today. After reading this book, you'd almost swear Brigham Young was writing these ideas for our day. It's fascinating. It talks about religion, talks about environmentalism, talks about all kinds of great things like that. So read it. And and I, I think it's just everybody should read that book. It's a fascinating book and helps people understand what is our responsibilities in the world and how we should be looking at things in a better way. So it's a great way to get your life in, as an adult started on the right foot is reading that book and going through it. Uh, the last one on here and the last book that we have to talk about is Eloquent Witness. 
this book is a really fascinating book. This is the one I, I just recently finished. This is the final book that I read. Uh, this is a compilation of articles that Hugh Nibley wrote and stories of Hugh Nibley in his life. So this is kind of like the other stuff that they didn't put in the rest of the books, in a, in a way, basically. And it talks about his life and some of the experiences he had. I didn't realize he had a, he had a, he died and came back experience. And uh, that was, that was crazy uh, what happened to him. And uh, he was really close to the spirit and was really close to, to God. You can tell in, in his writings and ideas, um, lots of cool stuff about the temple and the temple ceremonies in here. That's just mind blowing. If you've never been to the temple, you might not fully understand what he's talking about. After you've been through the temple, you'll be like, oh my gosh, this is so profound. So a lot of good stuff in there. That was a really, really good book to read. I got a lot of good quotes and ideas and things out of there as well. So Hugh Nibley is a profound guy, absolutely profound guy, way ahead, way ahead in his time. It's just amazing. I didn't realize, like he wasn't, you know, the average teenager is watching television and just barely pulling grades, you know, in basic classes in high school and junior high and stuff. And he was memorizing Shakespeare, the collected works of Shakespeare in junior high and high school. I mean, that's just a whole other level. You know, by the time he graduated, he was already out there. He's kind of, you know, his, he just almost like a Doogie Hauser of, of knowledge. The guy is just so far ahead of everybody else and uh, just profound. It's totally a gift that he had to be able to study this and understand this stuff so fast. And he had a lot of cool experiences in his life that helped him to gain access to what he needed to to be this smart. And if you want to watch those videos on YouTube of him teaching, it's fascinating. He is a fast thinker, and you, I, I had to rewind it a couple of times to go back and catch stuff because he'd be writing on the board and be talking and just idea after idea after idea would come out, and uh, really fascinating. Uh, it's a really fun one to watch. The, the two He did a two-part one in his class on the Shibako Stone where he put it up on an overhead transparency and actually translated the Shibako Stone for the class. It was really fun. So a lot of good stuff. Amazing guy. I absolutely recommend you read The Collected Works of Hugh Nibley. Fascinating stuff. Uh, the, these books are about 30 ish dollars a piece at Deseret Book. So they're not the cheapest books around, but it, you know, just buy one or two a year and just keep reading them. When you get one done, go buy the next one. Get one done, go buy the next one until you get them all done. Uh, one thing that I did is I don't have the full collector works of Hugh Nibley's on, on a hardback copy yet. I'm about halfway, a little past halfway there. Um, the I actually found a deal, so watch for this. Desert Book did a deal a couple years ago where they put the collector works of Hugh Nibley full digital version through their the Desert Book app for like 200 bucks, which is a steal. That is a steal to get that 19 books for 200 bucks. So I pulled whatever I had to do to all money together and bought it. And that's where I've read most of these books is through the, the digital version, which has been really handy because I'll, he'll, he'll go through all kinds of concepts. So I'll go in and actually like highlight a whole section copy it, paste it into my scripture. So as you go through the rest of the scriptures, uh, the scripture notes that I've done, you'll, I'll quote Hugh Nibley a ton. And uh, that's because I read his collected works and I copied and pasted a lot of stuff out when he talked about certain concepts and ideas. So it's really fun. So read those. You're going to love them. And uh, we'll